uh so good evening everyone i am dr bharat toshniwal pulmonologist from nanded maharashtra uh i welcome you all to this uh, wonderful initiative done by the cci uh since like i think past two two and half to three years uh the webinar series today's webinar is about some physiological concept it's like we have studied all of us from our physiology from our guidance it is about the abnormal respiratory patterns but what we have trying to do is uh, 3.5 years for 3.5 years uh, the webinars are going on so what we have tried to do is we are trying to make that physiological aspect into a clinical uh, aspect and how we can help as clinicians diagnose our patient and treat our patients in a better way with this applied physiology i have very uh, eminent pan panelist uh, uh, with me today uh, we have uh, hod kavana madam who is the hod of physiology uh, uh, from karnataka ambika madam she is a consultant chest physician assistant professor in sms jaipur we have shrikar sir consultant pulmonologist from apollo hyderabad and we all know sushil sir uh, the eminent interventional pulmonologist from raipur i welcome you all uh, for this webinar and uh, the flow of the webinar is we have initially two talks so all of you can just brush up your knowledge uh what you have read and then we will follow it with uh, the case discussions so uh, the first talk i will uh, call uh yeah kavana madam uh, for her talk on anatomy physiology and maintenance of respiration respected all good evening everyone thank you dr bharat for that warm introduction i thank cci for the opportunity given and i feel proud to be a part of cci and this webinar too topic of today's discussion is abnormal breathing pattern so before we move on to the deviation from the normal phenomena let me highlight some of the few of the concepts in physiology towards the regulation of respiration the physiology of regulation of respiration the term eupnea when we speak it depicts the normal respiratory rhythm the normal rate and depth which is regulated by a complex integration of the neural and the chemical control of respiratory mechanisms as like we say the homeostasis which works in all over the body it is same with the ventilation too wherein which any alteration in the ventilation as we are seeing here will be checked are taken up by the receptors or the sensors which may be chemoreceptors which may be pulmonary receptors the proprioceptors or the receptors in the airways where the message will be passed down to the center or the controllers which we are going to discuss in the further slides this message again is transferred to the respiratory muscles which act accordingly and cause the change in the ventilation the way it is required regulation of respiration broadly we classify into neural and chemical regulation of respiration where neural mainly regulates the pattern of breathing and the chemical regulates the minute ventilation that is the rate and the depth of respiration neural control is again divided into automatic control and the voluntary control voluntary control is mainly by the higher centers of the brain that is the cerebral cortex hypothalamus limbic system for example if i have to uh, share the voluntary hypoventilation breath holding all these are the one which act via the corticospinal tract where it bypasses the medulla so under automatic control it is the medullary centers and the pontine centers again in the medullary centers there are two group of neurons as you can see over here dorsal respiratory group drg and the ventral respiratory group of neurons the dorsal respiratory group of you know, neurons under below which you can see inspiration that is drg contains the i neurons which can activate the inspiration stimulate the inspiration ventral group of respiratory neurons they as they have both inspiration and expiration which wherein which acts when the demand for ventilation is more 
So this shows the respiratory centers in the brainstem. As we can see here in the upper pons, there is a situation of the pneumotaxic center and in the lower pons, there is apneustic center. In the medulla, there are two respiratory groups, that is the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group, which are present in the ventrolateral part of the medulla. Apart from this, we can also find the location of the central pattern generator, CPG, wherein which there are pre bodzinger complex cells, which are nothing but the pacemaker cells. As we say pacemaker, it is a spontaneous generation of the, of the rhythm of respiration. So that CPG is the one which is present in between the nucleus ambiguous and the lateral reticular nucleus. So this was discussed. Let me move on the slides. That is DRG is the one which acts during the quiet breathing and the VRG when the demand for ventilation increases, which contains both I and the E neurons. So coming on to the genesis of respiration, here this uh, flowchart shows how the inspiration expiration happens and how the rhythm of respiration is being maintained. Apneustic center is the one which acts as stimulatory control over the inspiratory neurons. And this inspiratory neuron passes on the impulses towards the respiratory motor neurons in the spinal cord, which via the phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves stimulates, moves towards the lungs, which stretches the pulmonary stretch receptors. The pulmonary stretch receptors via the vagus carry the inhibitory influence to the apneustic center. You can see over here, vagus has an inhibitory influence over the apneustic center, which keeps in check the inspiration should not happen for a longer time. That is how the inspiration is switched off, followed by expiration. So expiration and inspiration, they both have the reciprocal innervation. Apart from the inhibitory influence of vagus over the apneustic, we can also see the influence of the pneumotaxic over the apneustic, which shows the inhibitory influence again. This image shows the effect of transaction at the, of the brainstem at various levels. Suppose if I consider the B-level transaction, where the transaction is happening between the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center, here what is happening is, because of this transaction, when the vega is intact, you can see the rhythm of respiration or what we call the rate and depth of respiration is remaining the same. There is regular uh, breathing which is happening. But when the vega is cut, what happens? The negative influence of the vagus is lost over the apneustic center because of which there is arrest in inspiration, what is called as ap uh, apneusis. So this image or uh, the transaction at various levels of the brainstem explains us how uh, the rhythm, the rate and the depth is well maintained by this neural respiratory centers. So apart from the neural regulation, there are again, there is again uh, proprioceptors, uh, there are some stretch receptors in the airways, there are J receptors, there is something called as HB reflex, that is herring growth inflation and deflation reflex, which gets activated when the tidal volume is more than 1000 ml. Uh, so next coming on to when there is, apart from the non-chemical control mechanisms, if there is any change in the uh, chemical composition of the blood, that is, suppose if there is hypoxia or hypercapnia or acidosis, what happens? There is another set of receptors which gets activated. That is what we classify it under chemical regulation of respiration, where we can see the peripheral and the center. Peripheral carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. I'll show you the where this exactly located. You can see over here the um, carotid bodies which are being located adjust at the bifurcation of the common carotid into external and the internal carotid arteries and the aortic bodies are present. You can see over the dots which are seen over the aortic dots. Carotid aortic bodies are the one which has got the more amount of blood flow that is 2000 ml per 100 gram of tissue per minute which are made up of the glomus cells which have been highlighted just by the side of these carotid and the aortic bodies. And the other part of the image you can see the central and the medullary chemoreceptors, which exactly lie over the lateral surface of the medulla, which are highlighted in different colors. So, when there is hypoxia, when there is acidosis, it is the peripheral chemoreceptors which get stimulated. When there is hypercapnia, it is the central chemoreceptors which get stimulated, which sends the message to medullary respiratory centers, thereby increasing the ventilation. This is one 
flow chart or the image which shows how exactly when there is hypoxia the ventilation increases let me just brief you out uh, uh, how the hypoxia that is low po2 closes the potassium channels that is oxygen sensitive potassium channels because of which the cell depolarizes is the glomus cells depolarizes and the calcium enters we can see the entry influx of the calcium in the picture which causes the synaptic vesicle which are filled with the neurotransmitters dopamine to move towards the membrane where there is exocytosis and release of the neurotransmitters which get combined with uh, the receptors which are present with the glossopharyngeal neural ending which activates the action potential generation this signal is transferred to the medullary centers which again increases the ventilation this is how the hypoxia is going to increase or stimulate the ventilation so how about the increase in the carbon dioxide how carbon dioxide is going to so the same slides so i am keeping skipping the slides uh central chemoreceptors how the central chemoreceptors gets activated it's known that the carbon dioxide penetration to uh, towards the blood brain barrier and the blood csf barrier is very fast quick but h plus hco3 minus penetrates very slowly because of which the carbon dioxide when it gets into the csf what happens it, it gets hydrated resulting in the formation of h2co3 which again splits up to form h plus and hco3 minus this is how increase in the carbon dioxide which might result in increase in the h plus concentration which stimulate the central chemoreceptors there by the respiratory centers in the medulla and brings about the change in the ventilation or alteration in the ventilation this is again the summary which shows hypoxia acidosis stimulates peripheral and hypercapnia stimulates the central chemoreceptor so so to summarize the regulation of respiration apart from neural apart from central there are even other receptors maybe pulmonary receptors chemoreceptors myocardial chemoreceptors the influence from the higher centers of the brain all these are necessary which can bring about the changes in uh, ventilation via these respiratory centers and the muscles of respiration so these are the references so thank you uh, so i would like to uh, conclude uh, the discussion saying spontaneous respiration is produced by rhythmic discharge of motor neurons that's going to innervate the respiratory muscles in turn regulated by neural and chemical control mechanisms accordingly the rate the depth of respiration gets altered depending on the requirements of the body So I have kept simple the discussion using the concept maps, flowcharts, images to the maximum, uh, uh, trying to avoid the theoretical explanation over the slides for making the complex uh, concepts to understand in a simple way. Hope the regulation of respiration was well understood, and I once again thank CCI for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. at the outset i would like to thank dr nh krishna cci chess council of india and the office bearer to giving me this opportunity to speak on the topic abnormal breathing pattern i would also like to thank dr kavana to making the foundation for today's webinar and for the excellent talk so why we are uh, talking about this a abnormal breathing pattern because bedside observation of a patient's breathing pattern can hint us to many of the pulmonary diseases so objective of my talk today is to understand various terms in respect to breathing identify various abnormal breathing patterns understanding subtle differences between them and connecting each pattern with its cause so at the end we will be probably identifying unique feature to diagnose specific disorders So, as Dr. Kavana mentioned in her presentation about what is normal breathing called, it is called as eupnea. It is the normal, unlabored, and regular breathing at rest, and the respiratory rate is usually between twelve to twenty per minute. So, it has a normal pattern, depth, and rhythm. As you can see here in the graphic graphical representation, where each wave looks very symmetrical, very rhythmic, and in the normal depth. 
coming to the first abnormal breathing, which is bradypnea, where the breathing is abnormally at low rate. It is as low as less than 12 breaths per minute. And this can physiologically also happen in sleep, but pathologically can be seen in hypothyroidism, alkalosis, narcotic drug poisoning, and raised intracranial tension. So if you remember eupnea, you can carefully see this, these graphs and these waves look little spaced out, little slower in the speed. Opposite to bradypnea, there is tachypnea, where there, there is an abnormally rapid breathing rates can be observed. And in adults, when the respiratory rate is more than 20 breaths per minute, we call it tachypnea. So physiologically, it can be observed in patients who are nervous, on exertion, fever, and pathologically, in all the cases associated with hypoxia, various respiratory and cardiac conditions, and metabolic acidosis. So what we are observing in this graph is increase in rates of respiration, which is more than 20. One, now coming to the next abnormal uh, breathing pattern, which is apnea. So here what we are seeing, there is no breathing at all, complete shutdown of respiratory system. And we know two of this common variety of apnea, which are the center and obstructive sleep apnea. And this is what, when we want to graphically represent an apnea, it is a straight line. It is similar to a straight line as we see in cardiac arrest. In this straight line, what does it mean? There is no respiratory movements. Hypopnea is decrease in depth of respiration. And this will lead to decrease in tidal volume and minute ventilation. If we talk in the language of sleep study, it is more than 30% decrease in airflow but insufficient to meet the criteria of a flat line or an apnea. So it is commonly seen in obstructive sleep apnea. And if we want to observe in the graph, we have a reference graph of apnea on the uppermost figure. And at the lowermost figure, it is the normal breathing, where the waves are very symmetrically at equidistance present. Can you see apnea, which is a flat line, and hypopnea looks like in between the two of them. And it has a low amplitude. Hyperapnea, opposite to the hypopnea, has increased in depth predominantly and more or less many of time it is associated with rate increase in rate of respiration also, but predominantly what does it mean is increase in depth of, of uh, breathing. So because of the increase in depth, there will be increase in tidal volume and increase in minute ventilation, but this is consistent with the increase in metabolism as reflected by carbon dioxide production, what does it mean is that PaCO2 is normal in a patient with hyperapnea. So whatever increased carbon dioxide is produced in response to that, the patient or person is hyperapnea, taking a deep breath and he is able to remove that carbon dioxide. Where can we see in the, these conditions and patients who are doing a moderate exercise, they are probably taking a deeper breath. Now, we were talking about the amplitude of, uh, of respiration and then we were also talking about the rate of respiration. Now, here comes the situation, hyperventilation, where there is both increase in depth and rate of breathing. So, whenever we are talking hyperventilation or hyperventilation, probably we are dealing with the alveolar hyperventilation. In this, alveolar ventilation is increased out of the proportion to carbon dioxide production, leading to decrease in PSO2 below than the normal range. Typically, these patients complain of, I can't get enough air or oxygen. So here is a diagrammatic re representation of hyperventilation. I have put a picture of tachypnea also here because as I mentioned, tachypnea is just the increase in rate. Look at the angle of the graph, each graph or each mountains here. So they look smaller than the... Uh, uh, the graphic graphical representation of hyperventilation. So this is a small role, role play of a patient who is in a panic uh, attack, a female, young female, and she is hyperventilating. Please look at her breathing pattern, the chest movement and the shoulder movement, and how and what she is speaking. Can you work with me? Try to hold your breath while counting to 10? I can't breathe. All right, you're going to be okay. As we clearly saw, she was taking 
rapid breathes and they were quite deep. Opposite to hyperventilation is hypoventilation where there is an insufficient ventilation and this insufficient ventilation is incapable of removing adequate carbon dioxide from the blood. This can commonly see in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, sleep apnea, obesity leading to obesity hypoventilation syndrome, neuromuscular and CNS disorders and some of the drugs in intoxication. One of his causes is ondine curse where individual or patient with this disease forget to breathe during sleep but maintains relatively normal breathing pattern while they are awake. Coming to the next abnormal breathing pattern, which is Kuzma's respiration, it is deep, rapid and difficult breathing. It is named after German physician Adolf Kuzma and is caused by metabolic acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, uremia, cerebral tumor, toxic indigestion, and this is how it looks like. Deep, red, rapid and patient finds it very difficult to breathe. And they are so rapid and deep that there is hardly any pause between inspiration, expiration or uh, between the breaths. So this is a video, small video clip, which is showing Kuzma's breathing pattern in a 10-year-old male diabetic ketoacidosis patient. So deep breathe and high rates. So chain of strong breathing is another uh, important breathing pattern in which there is a cyclical breathing pattern characterized by apnea followed by a gradual rise in respiratory frequency and tidal volumes. And this happens because there is a swing in the cerebral blood flow. So in other words, what we can say it is a cyclic crescendo, decrescendo respiratory effort and airflow. Most commonly seen in patients with heart failure and this is the graphical representation of the same. What we can see here, so started with eupnea, increasing in the rate and depth of the respiration, and then slowly it is uh, decreasing and making going to the apnea, and again, the respiration is slowly, gradually picking up. So this is the ascending and descending or apnea and hyperapnea alternatively coming in uh, patients with chain stroke breathing. So this is a small clip uh, uh, and it is taken from the chest movements of patients who is admitted in a cardiac ICU, a patient of heart failure with ejection fraction of 25%. What we can observe here, the lowermost graph started with apnea, slowly, gradually increasing breathe and deeper breathe, increasing in tidal volumes. And what we can see again from the very beginning, the amplitude of this graph is decreasing, decreasing, settling down, and, and, and it will be followed with a complete cessation of breathe, which is apnea. So typically seen in patients with heart failure and stroke. Coming to the first abnormal irregular breathing pattern, which is bias breathing. It is named after French physician Camille Bayard, uh, who first time observed this breathing pattern. So there is actually consistent deep breaths interspersed with apnea due to damage to the pons from stroke, trauma or uncle herniation. And with the worsening pons insert, the pattern becomes irregular, eventually deteriorating to another breathing type, which is called the ataxic breathing. The bias breathing can also be seen in opiate intoxication. And this is how it looks like when we draw the graph of it. What we can see for sure, it is not a regular breathing pattern. It doesn't have any set pattern. So there is apnea, there are deeper breaths, there are eupneic breaths. So it is an irregular abnormal breathing pattern. Now coming to another uh, important breathing pattern, which is gasping. And many of uh, us in our, uh, in our world have uh, on kind of daily basis see this kind of uh, breathing, especially when we are working in ICU or or in other emergency department. What it is actually is the irregular quick inspirations associated with extension of the neck and followed by a long expiratory pause. We can see these conditions in severe cerebral hypoxia, shock, and this is a critical sign of life-threatening emergency, which is can be cardiac arrest, and this patient may be need CPR. So this is again a role uh, uh, display of agonal breathing. 
please observe it carefully. It's extension of neck, taking one gasp and there's a pause. Again a gasp and there's a pause. Coming to the next breathing pattern, which is apneustic breathing. So this is characterized by prolonged, again, gasping inhalations, followed by extremely short and inadequate exhalations. This also have a poor prognosis because the injury is at the pons or stroke or trauma. So temporary induction can occur by the administration of ketamine also for this kind of breathing. And this is, this is the graphical representation how the breeze looks like. So another very interesting breathing pattern, signing breathing pattern, and uh, I guess uh, most of us have seen this quite frequently, where the patients come with complaints of frequently interspersed deeper breaths in between normal breaths. They say that there is a desire to take deep breath, which no longer can be resisted, and then they have to take a deep sign breath to open up their lungs. And this can even seen at the rest. It is not related to exertion. And where can we see? This can be can be seen in healthy subjects. They are the habitual sign breathers, the patients with anxiety and depression disorder. And again, in the other words, the patient have this illusion of restricted chest expansion and insufficient breathe. So uh, uh, now I'm concluding my slides and presentations here is the diagrammatic representation of few of the abnormal breathing pattern which we have gone through uh, today. And But we will be learning about these abnormal breathing pattern or some of the one which I have not touched probably. We, all, we will take all that abnormal breathing patterns in our panel discussion. With this, I thank you all. These are my references. So with this, I end my talk here. And we will be discussing more in detail about all this abnormal breathing pattern in our panel discussion. Thank you very much for patience listening. Uh, over to you, Dr. Bharat sir. Thank you. So, uh... We had an excellent uh, talks by Kavana Madam and Ambika Madam. I think uh, they more or less summed up what we are going to discuss today. And uh, uh, this topic is a bit tedious or a bit difficult, but they have simplified uh, the talks and the concept, I think, very clearly. The flow is we will have few questions we have uh, to our panelists. And then in the end, we will have few cases so that all of you can take home very nicely what all these different types of breathings are. My first question is for Kavana, madam, who is an uh, eminent physiologist with us. Madam, what is the role of J receptors in the breathing mechanism? So, am I audible, sir? Yeah. yeah. Thank yes. you, sir, for that question. Uh, so, when we consider J receptors, actually, uh, they are juxtapulmonary capillary receptors. Uh, they are placed exactly in the interstitial space, which lie between the alveolar endothelial layer as well as the pulmonary capillaries. Uh, they are nothing but uh, unmyelinated uh, vagal nerve endings. Uh, actually, they are very sensitive to increase in the content of the interstitial fluid, which gets stimulated when there is pulmonary congestion, maybe when there is pulmonary edema, and when there is hyperinflation of the lungs. Suppose if we consider there is hyperinflation of the lungs, what happens is this unmyelinated vagal nerve endings, uh, they get stimulated. That means these J receptors get stimulated. When they get stimulated, uh, they are the one which are going to reinforce the action of the pneumotaxic center and as well as the centers in the pons, which produces the intermittency in inspiration, uh, what we call as inspiratory neuronal discharge, which results in maybe reflex apnea followed by tachypnea. There will be decrease in the heart rate as well as uh, decrease in uh, blood pressure. And finally, this can also result in the weakness of skeletal muscles. Uh, along with this, uh, if I have to explain the physiological role, uh, does it play any physiological role, these J receptors? Exactly, there is a physiological role. Uh, 
if we have to consider severe exercise what happens is when there is a severe exercise some excess fluid gets accumulated because of which the j receptors uh, are going to get stimulated which results in dyspnea and uh, uh, j receptors are going to inhibit the spinal stretch reflex uh, which uh, uh, decreases the skeletal muscle contraction that means uh, during severe exercise uh, the person get <laughs> exercise because of this uh, uh, skeletal muscle weakness and I, at this point of time i would like to add one more important thing as we all remember the bhopal gas tragedy which happened in 1984 second or third december night uh, where uh, some around 40 to 50 tons of uh, uh, methyl isocyanide were escaped from the uh, pesticidal plant the survivors of the bhopal gas tragedy Uh, A.S. Pental, who is the discoverer of J, of J receptors, has mentioned that uh, the one who escaped from the Bhopal gas tragedy, uh, they had uh, shortness of breath, they had reflex apnea, tachypnea, so and so, and he has correlated that symptoms with the stimulation of J receptors. So that is one point which we have to uh, uh, remember and remind of uh, the tragic event of Bhopal gas tragedy. Wow. Well, we never this. So this is a, a good point. I think everyone, anyone wants to add anything uh, to this or or any other questions to Madam regarding any receptor. If anyone wants, please pitch in, or we can have another question. So the next question is for uh, Ambika, Madam. Madam, what is actually uh, you have told about all the kinds of various kinds of breathing? But uh, uh, my postgraduate students they ask me what actually is the clinical difference or how to differentiate between a biased breathing and a cluster breathing? Ma'am, um, can you please elaborate on that? So thank you very much for the question. So yes, it is a bit difficult, especially when pulmonologist. Uh, uh, not that frequently come across with uh, this breathing pattern of bias or clusters breathing because this mostly is seen in the neurological disorders so both of them are abnormal breathing pattern and uh, both of them are a serious neurological issue and uh, what is the difference if you ask me so as i mentioned in my ppt also that Bias breathing is an irregular breathing pattern. What happens? There are deeper breaths or shallow breaths, and in between them, there is an apnea, which can be of any duration. So, why we call it irregular? Because one cannot predict that deeper breaths will come, and then apnea will come, or the shallow breaths will come. So, it is an irregular pattern, which cannot be guessed. Like the pattern will follow in this way. So bias breathing is probably if we localize as my madam has mentioned about the central nervous system and respiratory center. So it is the medulla where the center can be, and the diseases or damage, tumor or trauma or uncle herniation of on of pons and medulla, both the places if they are involved, we see this bias breathing patterns. This can become more aggressive when uh. this irregularity is increased and it is seen especially when there is a pontine hemorrhage and pons involvement is also there and the breathing from bias become to the another breathing pattern which is a ataxic breathing pattern so this is the bias now coming to the another breathing pattern which is a cluster breathing pattern so unlike bias bias here what happens that breath comes in the clusters and then there is in between apnea breath will come in clusters there will be apnea then it will be comes in the clusters here if you say the got where is the center center is in the pons again trauma tumor and infections of pons or brain stem can lead to the uh, cluster breathing pattern so both of them are neurological issues and mostly seen in neurological icus or in the neurological emergency area or in the trauma center one can see this breathing patterns no fine fine great answer ma'am i think for all the post graduates who are uh, listening to this this is a good answer uh, clinicians maybe utna kaam humko iska nahi padta hai but while you are learning or uh, for for you to write in your exams or to answer i think madam has elaborated it very nicely my next question is for dr shrikar sir my very good friend from uh, polo hyderabad sir what exactly do you mean by paradoxical breathing
Shrikar sir, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Hello, am I audible, please? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. So, so what do you mean by paradoxical breathing? The question yeah. for you. Yeah. So paradoxical breathing. Here we'll refer to two concepts over here. We'll just discuss about them in detail. Uh, one is we can be talking about the neurological diaphragmatic paradox, wherein when normally what happens is when we take in a deep breath, the diaphragm is supposed to move downwards, and that's how the thoracic cavity expands, and as a result of this, the lungs increase in size the total lung capacity that's how a person reaches total lung capacity only if the diaphragm moves down so if at all anything opposite happens that is if at all the diaphragm is moving upwards during inspiration and downwards during expiration this is known as the neurological diaphragmatic paradox so in this what exactly happens is it could be either due to a weakness in the inspiratory muscles why could this weakness occur? Either due to a neurological insult, it could be a stroke or it could be some infection involving the phrenic nerve, for example, a varicella, herpes zoster, or it could be a poliomyelitis, or it could be a transverse myelitis, also causing phrenic nerve injury, or driver direct phrenic nerve injury. It could be either during cardiac surgery as a complication of a cardiac surgery, as a complication of CABG, or due to radiation-induced injury, or maybe direct trauma as in the case of road traffic accidents. The other thing which we need to know about is flail chest. It's not exactly a form of a diaphragmatic paradox, but it is a form of paradox. This occurs predominantly in trauma. There are two different uh, you know, definitions for this. One, they say that two ribs have to be two continuous or contiguous ribs. Let's say I talk about rib number two and three or rib number three and four. This should be injured or broken or increased in two different places. So one whole segment of the chest, which is not in continuation with the rest of the chest. We have a small piece of the chest. So this basically disobeys the normal inward and outward movement of the rest of the chest. So in case of a flail segment, we have a movement of the flail segment, which is opposite to the movement of the chest wall. So during inspiration, the flail segment goes in and during the expiration, uh, sorry, during the, yeah, and during the expression, the flail segment moves out. So this is what actually happens. Okay, fine. So this is what uh, is paradoxical breathing. Anyone wants to add anything to this? So uh, Sushil, sir, any more comments yeah. about paradoxical breathing you want to make? Oh, I think he has very nicely explained it well. I don't think anything must to be added to it, I think. Okay, uh, so we will nice go now to the clinical questions. Now, I my next question is going to be you. This is all theory. So now we will just go to some uh, applications of this. I feel, you say I am very young into practice, but mere pass. I think a pulmonologist ke pass sabse zada patient khansi or saans lag rahi hai. Yehi karan se aata hai. Or maximum jo saans lag rahi hai, wo jo patient rehte hai, unko actually there is no uh, per se a problem it is just an abnormal breathing like some of them hyperventilate some of them are anxious i don't know this is my clinical experience for like four or five years so my question to you sir is what is the most common type of abnormal breathing pattern which you see in your practice so that we can learn from you and how do you manage it now i think this as you have already mentioned for a pulmonologist the most common uh, abnormal breathing pattern is tachypnea. That's what we all see. And yeah. uh, I'm sorry, this is nothing fancy, but that's what we all see. I don't think pulmonologists see anything else usually. In routine clinical practice, most of the time we see tachypnea. And whenever we see tachypnea, that is a patient is having a respiratory rate more than 20. Even if it is, there is a subtle tachypnea, you should be cautious and you should start taking a detailed history, a good clinical exam, and, and relevant investigation according to lead to figure out the cause of tachypnea. Now, tachypnea can be various causes including anxiety or fever or various cardiac or respiratory illnesses. And so we need to really try to figure out what is the cause of the tachypnea. And unfortunately, in, when the tachypnea is relatively subtle, sometimes in our busy practice, you may miss it. So we always, I always believe that all of us should be doing a very good history and examination and look at the respiratory rate of the patient also as a part of your uh, evaluation of a particular patient. Another important thing which I would like to add here is 
though we are ask you have asked for a common problem that is tachypnea but what i say is that we should be able to know other relatively uncommon breathing pattern because sometime you will be able to pick them well if your brain and your eyes are trained to pick up those relatively uncommon or rare breathing patterns so i would put it this way that this the the whole exercise which we are doing today is to understand those subtle subtle simple things that by clinical examination or just by seeing the patient you are able to pick up those abnormal breathing patterns like biot breathing or chain stroke breathing so next time when you see a patient probably you will be able to see uh, able to recognize them and believe me we are often overlooking these cases and for me for example in, uh, we often go to neuro icus and once you start seeing these cases you start thinking about it you are able to pick it up and for example if you have seen a biot breathing or chain stroke breathing you can actually narrow down your evaluation narrow down your history narrow down your focus your history your examination and also your relevant investigation according to the pattern of breathing you are seeing for example just to say someone who is a diabetic and come with uh, abnormal breathing you should start thinking here is it having a ketoacidosis that's putting up the case like that so this is the way and for example a patient who is in a neuro icu having chain stroke breathing or, or biot breathing you should you should be able to focus your investigation and find out what is the cause of the problem he may having a neurological cause of problem and they are called you for breathlessness which is not related to your system so what i'm trying to say is the the whole exercise is we should be able to exactly clinically figure out what is the particular type of breathing we are seeing and also narrow down our evaluation accordingly so i don't think the, the, it, that these uncommon thing would not come to us all of us will see some of these abnormal breathing at some point of time and we should uh, train our eyes and brain for them that's what the whole uh, issue is here yeah great great answer sir great uh my next uh, question is for uh, kavana madam we'll go now into more clinical questions and clinical applications madam uh, you being a physiologist what is the role of chest physiotherapy as such in the management of this all abnormal breathing patterns in a long term um so uh, to answer your question uh, regarding uh, chest uh, physiotherapy uh definitely a physiotherapy uh -huh. expert would be a uh, uh, great uh, regarding this uh, answer but i i uh, try my best uh, underlying the physiological basis uh, for this actually when we say chest physiotherapy specifically we start with the objective of like to improve the ventilation to the areas of local lung area wherever there is obstruction uh, as well as uh, we also see towards with an objective of clearing the secretions as well as to improve the ventilation of the smaller airways so that that increases the lung compliance and uh, so that the work of breathing as well as the oxygen consumption will decrease and that will uh, definitely improve the gaseous system so if i have to comment on few of the uh, chest physiotherapy uh, manuals which are usually followed Uh, uh i can uh, uh, talk about the diaphragmatic breathing wherein usually the diaphragm takes over the role during the quiet breathing but in case of uh, the patients with respiratory illness uh, uh, what happens the patient might rely on the accessory uh, uh, muscles of respiration wherein which uh, the patient complains of breathlessness or the shortness of breath so this diaphragmatic breathing uh, maneuver uh, might help uh in order uh, in helping in clearing the secretions of the mucus from the respiratory passage so other than this uh, there is one more manual what we call as incentive spirometry uh, most of us are aware of that three colored balls which will be kept in the pipes where uh, <coughs> the different maneuvers of uh, inspiration uh, will be done so this also helps in the clearing of the airway secretions so other than this uh, there is uh, one more method called percussion where suppose if i consider this as the chest and usually we uh, do this uh, cupping procedure where this axis gives a cushion effect and this hollow sound could be there so that this is the maneuver which we do uh, for the cupping for uh, uh, percussion where it also clears off the secretions it is said so other than this uh, the vibration uh, procedure where uh, there is intermittent uh, chest compression we do and uh, as the person to uh, take a uh, normal breathing that this procedure is being done during uh, expirations and uh, other than this so there are also few maneuvers like other than a usual procedure like coughing which helps to remove the secretions 
and uh, positive expiratory uh, pressure manuals nowadays even uh, uh, just physiotherapy devices are also available that is uh, prep continuous positive airway cpap uh, procedures and uh, and the chest wall oscillation where high frequency uh, oscillation is been applied over the chest uh, uh, wall uh, which helps in clearing the secretions and uh, definitely uh, each of the device or the manuals whatever we use uh, is will be having uh, the risk as well as the benefits and the main intention behind the chest physiotherapy is in order to improve the compliance decrease the work of breathing and in or, and to uh, clear up the secretion so that the airway will be patent enough for the good better gaseous yes yes thank you thank you madam uh, taking this question only or this discussion i uh, my next question to ambika madam is like madam how do you really we differentiate i don't know i i mean uh, i might be wrong in this but this is what madam has spoken about is about or uh, the cases which are diagnosed which are in the icu or which are uh, long term diagnosed as copd and i just want to give an example if there is some young male uh, coming to your opd especially after covid the perception of breathing has changed a lot among uh, people this is what i feel so ambika madam how do we really differentiate between tachypnea hyperapnea hyperventilation kusmal's breathing is okay but this tachypnea hyperapnea hyperventilation whether it is really clinically significant or what to do about it when a patient walks into your opd with such complaints ambika madam thank you very much sir uh, a very interesting question no uh, as sushit sir also mentioned you know the tachypnea is the most common uh, abnormal breathing pattern which we see but unfortunately it is highly non specific because tachypnea can be seen in cardiac problem metabolic problem respiratory problem or if there is no problem it's just because of the fever anxiety it can be seen in that way so it is non specific but one thing is that if this is an important vital sign and the patient's respiratory rate is more than 20 per minute it means we need to thoroughly see this patient this patient has come with a uh, important finding of tachypnea let's rule out the cause where it is lying whether it is a cardiac or the other one so here is one uh, pattern the tachypnea is actually only the increase in respiratory rate and this can happen in more lot of clinical condition which i enumerated other than that is hyperapnea hyperapnea is different from tachypnea where tachypnea is only increase in rate hyperapnea is there is increase in depth of respiration the rates may or may stay same so the amplitude of the graph as as, as I, i was mentioning in my uh, uh, ppt so uh, that is increase that means the tidal volume the patient is taking really deep tidal volumes and increasing the minute ventilation the good thing about hyperapnea is mostly it is seen in the physiological states like moderate exercise you know when the, there is more of the oxygen requirement or little more carbon dioxide is formed which is washed out with taking deep breaths like hyperapnea so these two are uh, uh, this way and the similar looking thing is you know uh, hyperventilation syndrome and in hyperventilation what happens it's a mixture of both the rate is also fast and there is uh, there is a depth of the respiration which is tidal volume and minute ventilation is also very high difference between uh, hyperapnea and hyperventilation is very important when we do a abg what we find hyperapnea patients have a normal abg and a psu2 levels are normal they never exceed to clear it out and uh, opposite to this in hyperventilation what happened the psco2 is washed patient goes in respiratory alkalosis and as we know this can happen in many conditions the common one which we show uh, we uh, saw in the video was a hyperventilation syndrome and a panic attack in a female and uh, in this such patients what we have to do we have to check for the clinical examination chest auscultations and all and if we find we do a quick abg and we find the patients in respiratory alkalosis so in that way it can hint to this and same similarly going when we are talking about tachypnea hyperapnea and uh hyper hyperventilation similar looking is the kusmas breathing that is also fast and rapid breathing in fact hyper ventilation is is uh, kusmas is one kind of a hyperventilation but kusmas is so fast it depends upon the level of acidosis in the blood 
So there is no pause between inspiration and expiration. They are all coming touched to each other. So this is a subtle difference between all the four patterns which we see in clinical practice. And thank you, ma'am. I think madam made a very good point here that a detailed ABG should be your go-to or final investigation if you have any confusion uh, about what kind of breathing pattern you are dealing with. Uh, uh, coming to our next question, I think I want to ask Dr. Shrikar, which there is a very important subset in the abnormal breathing patterns, which, which is the sleep disorder breathing. So, sir, can you just, I think this webinar will be short if we go into details of uh, SDBs, but in short, can you just answer what are the different types of sleep disorder breathing we see? Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Bharat sir. So we'll just, as uh, you said, we'll try to be as brief as possible because that is otherwise a Pandora's box altogether and a separate webinar. But just to highlight them, we have just discussed about apnea. Amika Madam has, you know, kind of shown us the graph and tried to explain. So apnea is nothing but either a complete cessation or a near cessation of airflow to the tune of at least 90% decrease in the airflow compared to the preceding signal. So as we all know, during a polysomnography, we uh, measure the, uh, you know, the, the airflow as well as the change in rate of flow. So for an apnea, basically, uh, we differentiate it as an obstructive apnea or a central apnea or a mixed apnea based on whether the patient is having respiratory effort during the event. So if at all the patient has stopped breathing, that is, the flow is 90% lesser along with continued respiratory effort as we can make out with the respiratory inductance plethysmography. In that case, we call it as an obstructive apnea, which means there is no breathing, but the abdominal muscles do try to struggle and maintain some sort of an effort during the process of this apnea. Now, central apnea is absence of breathing and absence of a respiratory effort. So the whole chest right from the, sorry, the whole uh, chest and the abdomen appear flat and it looks as if the patient has not try, is not trying to make an effort to breathe at all. Mixed apnea is a little different because initially there will be an absence of respiratory effort and the later part of the event is followed by the appearance of the abdominal movement. This happens throughout without any airflow. So initial part of a mixed apnea, there is no airflow and no respiratory effort and the later part of the mixed apnea has a respiratory effort and hypopnea basically is there is a reduction in the airflow to the tune of about 30 percent so we can make out a different uh, if you are observing the video recording of a patient who is being subjected to a level one polysomnography we can make out that the airflow does decrease to about 30 to 35 percent but not as much as an apnea but of course in both the cases, that is apnea and hypopnea, the diminished airflow should last for at least 10 seconds. The only thing for an hypopnea, we have an additional concept of a desaturation. So if at all, there is a 3% desaturation from the baseline, let's say started off with 94, goes to 91, or there should be an arousal. However, because we have so much of inter-observer variability, if to make it simpler, they mentioned that a hypopnea should just have a 4% desaturation. Whatever be the initial value, there should be a 4% drop from that initial value. There is another interesting phenomenon which is called as a respiratory effort related arousal. So this basically is a change in airflow that does not meet the category of an apnea or a hypopnea. But notice the initial part of the term that is respiratory effort. So there is a disproportionate increase in the amount of respiratory effort which is much more than what is observed for an apnea or a hypopnea. So this is a thing which everyone should observe instead of relying on the machine related, uh, you know, situation. Suppose the machine may, you know, interpret this as a apnea or a hypopnea, whereas a trained polysomnography will interpret it as a respiratory effort related arousal. Chain stroke breathing has already been uh, described, but as far as polysomnography is concerned, we need at least three such events. Okay, three such consecutive central respiratory events in the crescendo and the decrescendo state and we need to have a cycle length of at least 40 seconds. So this is what differentiated, especially if the person is asleep, we want to label it as change stroke respiration in our final report. These criteria have to be present and at least five such apneas and hypopneas of central apneas and hypopneas should be present per hour.
Okay, so three consecutive central events followed by at least five such apneas. And lastly, hypoventilation. Hypoventilation, Madam has already explained, but as far as sleep is concerned, we should be documenting a raise in the PCO2. So it, the absolute value of PCO2 should be at least more than 55 millimeters of mercury for at least 10 minutes. This we can document it with a transcutaneous PCO2 monitoring, uh, transcutaneous CO2 monitor. Or if at all we are not able to get an absolute value, we should document an elevation of at least 10 millimeters above the baseline value for the same length of time. This we have to see in a COPD, who is a habitual CO2 retainer. Let's like we'll say started off with 55 millimeters. His value should go to at least 65 millimeters of mercury for a period of 10 minutes or more during sleep. That's when we call it as a hypoventilation. Okay, perfect. Very nicely. I think the last point is a, a very uh, take home point for all it, because in an advanced COPD, we might misinterpret uh, uh, the patient. So uh, my next question, uh, trying to summing up uh, to Sushil sir, who is the most experienced uh, panelist we have. Sir, uh, what are the abnormal breathing patterns which you see in adolescents especially and uh, does over mobile use or anxiety stress due to exams does this all psychological issues have a predominant in manifestations of the same especially when you're the outpatient uh, uh, department patient uh, with an abnormal breathing pattern sir uh, yes uh, psychological issues uh, are important in uh, pediatric patient and adolescent patients i call uh, i would divide the various abnormal breathing patterns in adolescents into three uh, different uh, categories one is psychological causes other is um, the pathological cause and the third one is physical so to go into more details of it now if you look at the psychological psychological causes anxiety uh, depression and you as you rightly said over mobile use and peer pressure, all these things can lead to psychological pressure on the kids and they can have abnormal breathing patterns. So psychological, psychological causes have an important role and that need to be looked at and should be... Hello? Yeah, yeah, sir. I'm audible. No? Oh, sorry. So psychological causes need to be looked at and should be addressed if there is a psychological reason. If there is an anxiety or depression, you are able to... Uh, analyze and feel that, then you may have to involve a psychiatrist to help you. That is one thing. Second thing is, uh, the as I said, pathological causes. Um, patients may have asthma, which may be undiagnosed or their patient may be actually having something else and they have been diagnosed as asthma. So need to be looked at the pathological causes. A lot of uh, times in kids, the asthma may be misdiagnosed or maybe not diagnosed at all. So then, the, so that need to be thought of in case someone uh, uh, adolescent is having breathlessness on exertion along with other signs and symptoms of asthma. Third thing which comes to my mind is physical causes. Again, that's important because obesity is fairly common in adolescent nowadays, and that also can cause abnormal breathing pattern. So these are the things we need to look at: psychological, pathological, and and, uh, and uh, physical causes. So we need to look at all these possible causes in adolescence. And as I already mentioned, psychological causes and physical causes are now becoming more and more prominent and more and more visible once you start looking at it. And with today's lifestyle, these two are important causes apart from the previous pathological conditions like asthma or other chronic respiratory diseases. So we need to look at in all pediatric and adolescent cases also. I think sir has put it up very nicely, divided it into three types and I think all of us right from day one of our practice we see uh, or we are likely to see such patients. Uh, there is one more question from Dr. Harendra Thakkar from Gujarat. Uh, how to differentiate with between various types of uh, acidotic breathings? I think Dr. Shikhar sir, I would like you to answer this. Yeah. So as far as uh, acidotic uh, breathing is concerned, uh, there is a very variable presentation. Though we associate uh, Kusmal's breathing uh, more commonly to acidosis, uh, we may have a slight difference between our and overlap between tachypnea, like Kusmal's breathing, and also simple hyperopnea as far as uh, acidosis is concerned. And the rate of, or sorry, the depth of acidosis also kind of differentiates between. So in very severe acidosis, once we have a 
you know once it goes beyond the peripheral uh, chemoreceptors to pick up acidosis we do see because the pre- the, the uh, activation of the peripheral chemoreceptors or the glomus body rather is going to increase the depth and the rate of respiration but once the acidosis becomes so severe that the central nervous system is affected once the uh, csf uh, uh, bicarbonate levels are affected then we can have a classic deviation from this pattern of breathing we may actually have sometimes you have variable presentations like maybe a bradypnea in some individuals uh, you may actually have irregular breathing patterns in some individuals so Uh, the the level of acidosis and the extent of uh, you know the change in bike or the bicarbonate shift in the csf is what you know the, decides the pattern of breathing in a patient with acidosis mm. very nicely uh, explained so i just got a message that uh, uh, this webinar is being watched by approximately 1155 people are watching it live so we thought it is an abnormal topic but many people are definitely interested in this uh, hearty congratulations to the entire uh, team of cci the core committee uh, nh krishna sir especially who is the brain child behind this topic and obviously sipla for this great uh, academic uh, initiative uh, if there are no more questions i think we can go to few cases to sum up our discussion for everyone Uh, so that people can understand what we have all discussed up till right now is it okay if i share my screen yeah please just a moment <coughs> so we have four cases here uh, for us to discuss and uh, i'll take them one by one uh, the first case i think i will ask uh, most senior panelist of us uh, to answer this case scenario 1 a 27 year old student was admitted to the icu with decreased level of consciousness gcs 9 his lab investigations with a very high sugar urea of 282 high creatinine the abg shows the ph is 7.24 pco2 15.6 po2 104 the bicarbonate is 6.7 his breathing pattern was observed to be deep labored and rapid type sir what are we dealing with this uh as you have already mentioned this is a young male coming with altered sensorium and very high blood sugar and with aki so and with the uh, acidosis so this is a metabolic acidosis so this patient is having a diabetic ketoacidosis with aki and uh, that's the diagnosis i would make now important things to see look at it here is that this patient is also having something which is uh, uh, kusumal's breathing so patient of diabetes coming with an abnormal breathing you should always keep this in mind that this can be a possibly a case of diabetic ketoacidosis so if you see an abnormal breathing like that and with a high blood sugar uh, then definitely that need to be think about thought about so a diabetic patient when he comes to you in your clinical practice with abnormal breathing i would like to do of kusumal's breathing if you are able to figure out that this is a kusumal's breathing you do three things one is do your the sugar blood sugar second is look for the ketones uh, either blood or uh, you can you can if it is not available you can see the urinary ketone and the third thing is the blood gas so once you have done these things you should be able to diagnose a case of diabetic ketoacidosis on the basis of it and once you have diagnosed it as a case of diabetic ketoacidosis we i would pr- uh, suggest to do three more things one is l- look at the serum electrolytes get the renal function test done and the cbc so these are the tests we should do so that we can further manage this patient better so now this patient is a case of diabetic ketoacidosis with aki and in this patient the management as all of us know we should treat this patient with fluids uh, this patient will need fluids will ne- need iv uh, insulin therapy to get the sugars down and to manage the serum electrolytes these are the core things we need to look at uh, treat it and then w- once we do that we should be able to manage this patient properly so that would i would uh, suggest uh, mm, uh, that's the way i would manage this patient yeah so as sir had already told all of you that 
once you look at these breathing patterns probably you can diagnose the patient better and you can manage the patient also better what investigations to send and how to manage you can get an idea with this so uh, my second case uh, this is for shrikar sir a 54 year old female known case of type 2 diabetes hypertension presented to emergency department with complaints of new onset vertigo and left sided weakness of 5 hours duration she also presented with left sided hemisensory loss with decreased pain and temperature perception facial asymmetry was noted the mri brain revealed the presence of large infarct in the right paramedian pontine region his breathing pattern was assessed which revealed a series of normal tidal volume breaths alternating a prolonged respiratory pause followed by a similar breath patterns there were varying apnea intervals between each such respiratory cycle so what are we dealing with this sir yeah uh, but it's so this is a, a classical case of a pontine stroke and we can notice in the right pontine uh, you know in the paramedian region so the problem with the pons is unfortunately it's a pretty big area so here we have got so many you know uh, vessels which are supplying it you have parts of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery superior cerebellar artery you know you have you know the the whole posterior circulation and as far as this particular area is concerned you have the paramedial perforating arteries which are basically basilar artery origin so as you can notice once the basilar artery is involved you can see the other symptoms which you are seeing here you know as they are having vertigo here and they are also having uh, you know this thing this uh, contralateral uh, weakness and along with uh, the uh, spinothalamic and the corticospinal tract involvement as you can make out this pain and pain temperature perception so once the pons is involved depending on the level even though it's mentioned in literature that you know the lower pons and higher medulla involvement you can have cluster breathing and but in uh, you know in reality if you read the case reports there's no particular clear differentiation as to which area of the pons can cause which type of breathing of course we have got biots breathing and madam had very beautifully explained the difference between biots and you know uh, cluster breathing and ataxic breathing but it is to be noticed here once you have got certain changes after this infarct if at all you have got uncle herniation what started off as a biots breathing can progress further it may move on to ataxic breathing ultimately and may go on to agonal breathing too so having a diagnosis here of a biots breathing of course this case is something which we won't really encounter on a day to day basis it may go to the neurologist but we may be called in uh, you know as uh, so that we assess what exactly is going on here you know they may get a doubt because the patient is immobile do we need to rule out a pulmonary embolism so what our uh, you know primary aim is is to try and identify this pattern here so after identifying the pattern and discussion with the neurologist it is important for us to thereafter prognosticate the patient as biots can lead away to some other pattern of breathing depending on the ongoing insult let's say there is a bleed into the left paramedian region so the 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 intracranial pressure may increase and we may switch over to another pattern of breathing so the mere identification is a sign of emergency our role is to make sure that we reveal the seriousness of the situation abg may help us or may not help us as far as a biots pattern is concerned but it is to you know inform the neurosurgeon and probably a neurosurgical team to should tell us that something more ominous is going to take place the patient is by no means clinically stable and we may have to prepare for the worst or rather take action so that we try to reverse this pattern of breathing with effective treatment very very nicely told i think for everyone listening this should be a take home point in nowadays where uh, even in all places wherever you practice medico legal scenarios are increasing so this especially when you are dealing with a neuro case the type of breathing pattern may help you to prognosticate a patient may help you tell the seriousness of the patient and probably you can counsel the patient's relatives accordingly i think this is a very practical point made by shrikar sir which every one of us should follow henceforth uh, coming to my third case uh, this uh, is one, for, yeah anyone one important thing what i would like to add to uh, what uh, in the second case is that 
Now, lot of times we are as a pulmonologist are called for cross consultation into neurosurgical and neuro ICUs. And whenever there is abnormal breathing pattern, it is thought that it is because of the respiratory cause. So please don't forget that there can be a lot of neurological causes which can cause abnormal breathing pattern. So that need to be thought of and should be managed accordingly. Yes, yes. Perfectly said, sir. So we may get a call from the ICU, from a neuro ICU, where we diagnose a breathing pattern. And as both of them said, we involve the, uh, the neurophysician or neurosurgeon and then we talk about it and uh, it's a, a joint management accordingly. My third case is for uh, Ambika, madam. Uh, we as pulmonologists are more likely to see such case, I feel, a 65-year-old male patient, known case of diabetes, hypertension, CAD, post-PTCA to LAD with an ejection fraction 35% and uh, there is some IHD component still present who has presented for a routine checkup. His baseline symptoms showed no acute worsening. Usual symptoms included breathlessness on exertion, NYHA grade 2, mild pedal edema, orthopnea, occasional episodic wheeze and nocturnal cough. His spouse had not noticed of late that he would progressively increase his depth of breathing to a point of gasping followed by a decrease which would ultimately end in long breathing pause. This pattern was observed during sleep as well as during wakefulness state while he was reclining on an armchair. Madam, what are we dealing with? So the breathing pattern described in this case scenarios is consistent with chain Stokes breathing. So if somebody has to learn the definition of a chain, this question has been designed so very beautifully. It it takes all the important point what is seen in the patients with chain stroke breathing one elderly with cad ejection fraction 35 percent patients have dyspnea pedal edema orthopnea and nocturnal cough these are all goes with the congestive cardi cardiac failure and the, what the wife has noticed for his husband's her husband's sleep pattern is that she's noting that he's slowly gradually taking breaths and sometimes he is not taking breath and that is the probably the concern the wife has because many times it looks like the patient is not breathing at all or is it dead or something like that the apneas can go really long for the even it has been reported that it can go up to the 40 seconds or so so the patient goes in the gasping pattern. And uh, interestingly, the other very important point which has been mentioned in this question also that these patients can have this breathing pattern both when they are in sleep or they are awake. So this pattern of ascending, descending breathing pattern and apnea goes very consistent mm -hmm. with the chain stroke breathing. I also want to bring a very uh, uh, important pathophysiology which is postulated for this condition, you know, uh, because if we see all the graphs, this graph looks most interesting, you know, it, it is very good to draw slowly, gradually picking up and then a flat line. Then go. So what is the reason behind this pathophysiology? So patients with uh, chain stroke breathing and patients with the central sleep apnea, especially with the patients of heart failure. So they have a baseline decreased PACO2 level. As Dr. Kawana ma'am has mentioned about the chemoreceptors, the neural uh, inputs. So the chemoreceptors in the blood, they can sense this hypo, uh, hypocapnia. And uh, what they will do, they will ask, uh, so, uh, they will ask uh, uh, the uh, brain, the, the signals will go to the brain and the brain will ask the respiratory muscles to slow down. To slow down to maintain the pH/CO2 level. As we all know, that balancing is the nature of our body. The pH need to be balanced. The pH/CO2 and PO2 need to come in the compensations. So the compensation starts, and what will happen? The pH/CO2 will start because there's an apnea. It will start building up. It will come to the normal. So in ideal situation, when it comes to the normal, the brain should and the chemoreceptors should make the uh, the brain know that the, the pH is normal but what happens in patients with heart failure their heart are really pumping slow so there is a delay from the pumping to reaching the uh, uh, cerebral circulations so by the time the brain receives again that the apnea uh, uh, is over the psa to normalize the patient stays in apnea for longer and then he eventually goes in uh, hypercapnia the psa to rises 
So what brain will get another signal is about that carbon dioxide has rose and it will give the brain, uh, the brain will direct to the respiratory muscle that you have to take fast breathe hyperapnea. So that carbon dioxide goes off and wash off. And when it is washing off, again, the same con uh, because of the delay in the circulation, it will wash off too much and there will be decrease in PACO2. And this keep on going, this cycle keep on going in patients with congestive heart failure. And uh, uh, surprisingly, it is quite common in patients with heart mm -hmm. failure. It can be seen as commonly as in 50% of these cases. And if the apnea episodes last longer and these are very consistent finding in the patients, sometimes it, it, it suggests that it is not a good prognostic uh, finding what we are seeing in patients with heart failures. So all these patients uh, may be probably can be treated with oxygen inhalation and CPAP therapy works very magical. So sleep study has become very popular in these patients and we are picking a lot of central sleep apnea and chain stroke breathing pattern in patients with heart failure. I think very nice point made by madam that especially when you are dealing with a heart failure patient uh, in all parts of India now sleep study is picking up and then uh, we we have a mixed sleep disorder breathing maybe a chine stroke breathing and accordingly you can uh, manage this patient. My last case uh, uh, is uh, to Kavana madam this question is an 87 year old man presented to OPD with shortness of breath of one month duration along with loss of weight and appetite examination revealed a, a cachexic male with mild confusional state routine blood investigations were normal abg showed a ph of 7.6 pco2 14 po2 115 hco3 bicarbonate was 11 ct chest was normal MRI brain revealed a T2 prolongation of the right frontal lobe and right dorsal midbrain. It was a biopsy proven CNS lymphoma. His breathing pattern was assessed which showed a tachypnea without respiratory pauses and showed no response to uh, deep sedation. Madam, what are we dealing with? Hello, Kavana ma'am. So uh, it's a case of 87 year old man who's presenting to the OPD. Uh, as we see here, the ABG analysis, pH is high, uh, PCO2 value is low, uh, where the ABG analysis point towards the respiratory alkalosis. Uh, so uh, uh, Ambika Madam has uh, excellently explained already the scenario behind this. Uh, it's a case of central neurogenic hyperventilation. Uh, from the physiological point of view, uh, if I have to explain this, uh, actually when there is a uh, supramedullary inhibitory pathway is damaged, what happens exactly is the medullary central chemoreceptors, they become more sensitive to uh, the action of the carbon dioxide. That is where we see this hyperventilation. Once there is hyperventilation, uh, the, the phenomenon of increase in the rate and depth pat uh, pattern of breathing happens. So along with this year, we are also uh, noting uh, the mild confusional state where Dr. Sushil sir has already explained even the psychological issues that happens with the uh, uh, breathing patterns. So the tachypnea, the lower levels of PCO2, usually what does it do is it decreases the formation of H plus and HCO3 minus in the blood, which is going to cause the increase in the pH to about 7.6 what has happened here. So along with this, uh, there are even other explanation with the physiological basis, if I have to explain. Uh, what happens exactly here in the central neurogenic hyperventilation is there is uninhibited stimulation of both the inspiratory as well as the expiratory uh, group of neurons in the medulla, uh, right from the lateral reticular formation and as well as from the laterally located descending pathways. So because of this, uh, the hyperventilation is being seen here, which is the breathing pattern, abnormal breathing pattern explained in this scenario. Hope I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sushil sir uh, can help me out in connection with the uh, clinical symptoms along with the physiological basis. What I think you have already described it. Nothing more to add in this particular case. Uh, anyone else from the panelists want to add something to it? I think uh, this is uh, all what we have discussed is enough for this particular case, I feel. Uh, 
because uh, these cases are generally seen or uh, what we see as a palliative medicine kind of uh, thing is there this breathing pattern as shrikar sir had pointed out we may be able to prognosticate patients on basis of this breathing pattern especially when a neurological case you are dealing with a neurological case uh, there is one question from our very own tridip sir from uh, mumbai uh, i will keep it open but i will put up it to savana madam because it is uh, how actually useful are these oscillation devices there are positive pressure devices like the aerobica which is marketed by a company they uh, uh, are they supposed to have some uh, good action in clearing secretions when specially you are dealing with any abnormal breathing pattern patient madam please what are your views on it ma'am can you hear me so you were talking about those percussion therapies and all so are what are your views on any particular device like this aerobica device which the is being spoken about or any other uh, device which a physiotherapist uses for clearing of secretions how useful is that Uh, so as i said sir uh, like actually each device has its own risk has its own uh, benefits and actually when we speak of this oscillation uh, high frequency chest wall oscillation devices uh, what uh, usually it involves like there'll be a uh, inflatable vest which will be covered over the chest which will be attached to a machine and uh, usually it's like a physical uh, chest therapy where uh, high frequency vibration is being given off and it is uh, said that the vest which covers the chest wall uh, which vibrates at a high frequency is going to uh, loosen and uh, loosen the secretions as well as it is going to thin out the mucus secretions so every person every 5 minutes what happens is the person stops the machine coughs and uh, takes off the secretions this is what happens in usual oscillation devices uh, which we use uh these have been uh, i guess been used in uh, uh, um, the chest therapy uh, department physiotherapy department where uh, definitely it's going to loosen the secretions at the end of the procedure the person is made to cough out and uh, throw out the secretions i appreciate uh, sir would you like to add any clinical aspect for this like how no. we i put it this way now we are talking about abnormal breathing patterns and we are talking about cough uh, cough releasing devices and those devices which could help to bring out the cough there are two i think there are two different aspects of the problem uh, i would what i would say is that yes these devices are there in the market for a long time lot of devices i have seen in last two decades which have come and gone none of them has really become very popular yes theoretically there are paper theoretically i would say even uh, there are papers which have suggested that these devices are useful to bring out the secretions and the thick mucus plugs which are in the airways they are help uh, but uh, those commercially available devices for the patient directly have not taken off very well in real world practice that's what i would say yes the physiotherapists whatever they are doing for physiotherapy and exercise training and other thing which they are doing in the department that has well proven that is well. but those devices which are commercially available for direct use to the patient have not really taken off very well that's what i have seen there are a lot of devices which came the flu came and then there are other devices came which were didn't really took off very well at least from the clinical perspective anyone would add to it uh, i have seen so many devices which came and gone none of them has really stayed with the test of time in clinical practice uh, sir uh, please correct me if i'm wrong so what i also wanted to uh, you know kind to understand is whether these devices have a role only if used correctly like let's say the person has to use hypotonic saline first to moisten or humidify the airway then followed by the use of a oscillating uh, pep device and at the same time probably add on a chest physiotherapy to ultimately loosen the secretions and cough it up at the same time using additional techniques like maybe an active cycle of breathing technique or a diaphragmatic breathing exercise i think if all are used in synchrony and in a correct fashion probably then it would have i think uh, opep has no individual role by itself if a person doesn't humidify the airway there's no meaning in using aerobica to loosen its secretions um, practically none of them has really really stayed the test of time i remember there was a device for lung flute which came in yes, which was yes. fda approved 
and they mm-hmm. never asked for all these uh, prerequisites for using it and mm-hmm. uh, we were very excited about it and really it didn't stood the test of time and it just gone we are no longer having it in the market anymore mm-hmm. so all those devices which are been given to the patient for mm-hmm. use at home have somehow doesn't stayed well in real world that's what i'm trying to say they may have some role but somehow practically they have never stood the test of time in real world as far as the physiotherapist who are using them devices uh, various devices in the physiotherapy department they have really gone well for example the percussion device and other thing that have been there but these are all the, i am we are talking about devices like aerobica or lung flute which has not really i would say in clinical practice it has not done much though they have some proof that they may help to bring out the secretions of mucus plus from their airways and help them to breathe better but really in practice it's not taken off well that's what i would say what is your comment i don't know any other panelists would add to it ambika madam any comments you want to make you know i think sir has elaborated very nicely but i uh, uh, when uh, i had a question when sir was mentioning about a common uh, respiratory or abnormal respiratory pattern what he see in his practice so i uh, i think this is uh, uh, it's not very serious problem but we see quite frequently and i want to know sir's experience also on this dr sushil sir if he can take this question about the sign breathing many patients come sit on the opd chair and you, you just uh, displayed yeah. and they find it a serious problem yeah they yeah. find it is madam mere saans nahi aati and i have to take this way the breathing and uh, uh, over the years of practice now we have become very confident initially we used to evaluate like they need psychological but sir i want your uh, you know uh, comments on this uh, uh this situation how do you handle this and uh, what works for the habitual sign breathers you know when we're, when we are not finding anything especially i've seen the patients who has na- nasal blockage they also do lots of sign breathing and Sorry, uh, i i was i lost my connection between can you just brief it in a one, on a one or two lines yes so, so about the sign breathing taking deep breath into normal breath you know they have everything normal and uh, their complaint is will be just that taking from the mouth a deep breath and feeling relaxed kind of and they have this irresistible feeling of taking this and uh, and there are some habitual sign breathers also so uh, what what Maybe is your psychiatric say? consultation may help a psychiatrist consultation may help in these patient mm-hmm. i have seen patients who have everything normal and they have a problem and with good counseling and a psychiatric consultation it helps sometimes not in every patient but some patients that's why once because you have done every possible test still the patient keeps on coming every few months saying that i'm a problem and somehow a psychiatric consultation and a good counseling may help in some subset of patient uh, i don't know what other panelists have the view point on that uh, so I sir think- i basically practice neuro linguistic programming and uh, administer cbt myself due to having a degree in cognitive psychology so what i noticed about sigh breathing is as you rightly said sir they do have an underlying uh, psychiatric issue but to be more specific they are not psychotic because they have insight into the problem they are definitely a neurotic subtype most probably it could be generalized anxiety disorder so if at all we have got time it's better to call these patients towards end and try to go to the root cause since how many years did they start sighing and or rather when, when usually most of the time as uh, madam uh, sushil sir has mentioned they won't really say they just complain of breathlessness and then on subtle questioning they mentioned that yeah i have to force air deep into my lungs sometimes or in the night also have to force air deep into my lungs then i feel satisfied and then go off to sleep so there are different variations to each person's expression so if at all we need to make them comfortable and they are generally in a denial mode they feel there's something wrong with their lungs and they're not ready to accept the fact that there is a probably a, a mild neurotic problem so we give them the example saying that uh, try to imagine yourself if they are a well educated person we say that give them an example either 10 minutes before obtaining a important exam result or maybe 4 5 minutes before getting an interview result so we can try to tell them that this is is this how you would have felt at that time and probably even if i give you your favorite food you would not touch it but you would definitely appreciate eating or interacting with people after you get your result irrespective of what the result is whether it is positive or negative so then they try to picture themselves in that situation and uh, psychics the problem is sir if they told they start them on ssris ssris would only try to change this side breathing pattern but it will do nothing to correct the anxiety cause so the minute they stop using ssri and a benzodiazepine combination 
after which they again resume sign so the best is along with the psychiatric consultation we go and start them on usually cognitive behavior therapy for a generalized anxiety disorder we start them on cbt then within about the, the third or fourth session once we have managed to try to diagnose the root cause of it whether it's a financial cause or whether sometimes it can happen post menopause also they feel like talking a lot and they are having hot flushes the people around them their own children who are already probably in a very busy phase of life they'll be in their 20s by the time the woman is in menopause stage then they stop listening to them so they say that i'm not able to speak to anyone if i try to talk i get scolded very frequently during this time they may come to our opd with sigh sigh breathing so it's like trying to get to the root cause and then trying to slowly you know help them so it will take a good 2 to 3 months of intensive counseling and family counseling also the patient alone being counseled will not help we need the family members to be present along with them and uh, trying to get them out of denial is the first step before treating them this is what i had experienced in like the last like 7 or 8 years very nicely elaborated very nice okay. Uh, basically yeah we need patient we need to counsel ourselves we may need a counselor and maybe we need a psychiatrist i think this is the team work and yes. then we sit with the family along with the patient and then once everything is comes together then maybe we are able to help these patient to some extent and this is a long process this is not a one day job and it's a team work probably yes so with that team work i think uh, i had a very very fantastic team today we were discussing ki hum ye ka aadha ghante mein khatam ho jayega but now i think we are past our time we had a very good discussion i would like to thank all my panelists sushil sir shikhar sir ambika madam uh, khawana madam for making this uh, discussion so interactive and wonderful so that everyone could understand it from basics right up to the top obviously uh, i want to thank uh, my elder brother uh, vijay sir he is the backbone of all this cci webinars for making me a part of it and uh, arranging this webinar such smoothly that uh, we don't feel all the stress about it and definitely all the cci core committee and nh krishna sir for this wonderful uh, topic of his which got us to the basics and keep us thinking that how can we manage patients on depending on their breathing patterns i think thank you everyone any more comments from anyone and so that we can end. i just uh, one thing i would like to add now once we dis- decided this topic in last few days i picked up two abnormal breathings in my clinical practice in my mm-hmm. icu one was a chain strokes breathing and one was kusumal's breathing i picked up just because i was thinking about it and i yes. was able to pick up So that is said sir once we think about it agar aankh aur hum dimag se khule to we will catch last, it last four four days or five days i have picked up two abnormal breathing that we were able to uh, <laughs> say that okay this is the type of breathing we recorded it and then we, we showed it to my resident that okay this is the abnormal breathing we are seeing here so that's what i'm saying once you start thinking about it you are able to pick it up and that's what is clinical medicine all about yes yes perfect perfect so thank you everyone once again and uh, uh, wish you everyone a very good night and we will see you with some other cci webinar soon all of us okay thank you thank you thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you.